Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. This is John from Flippin' Ain't Easy, and thank you all for joining me today. Uh, another one of my impromptu live streams, and uh, it's going to happen a lot. It's uh, one of those things where usually it happens the night before. I'm trying to figure out what would be a good topic uh, to, to give you guys. And uh, if I'm just stumped and I don't really have time to make a video, I'll usually just decide to do a live stream the following day and uh, take on your questions and, and that type of thing. Um, you know, that's the challenge that we usually have when we're reselling and we're doing the YouTube gig. Um, we're trying to devote as much time as possible to our main source of income, which is reselling. And then um, to try to get material to you guys is always always one of my challenges. I'm not the kind of uh, person that's going to make a video for the sake of making a video and hope that you guys are happy with it because there's been many times I've uh, made videos and just could not get myself to even edit the thing because I knew that it's not something I would want to watch. So um, just wanted to, to guys, let you guys know that. Uh, we're going to we have like only a few people right now that are watching and that's probably because uh, again, it's an impromptu kind of thing. If you haven't hit the bell, that notification bell, you'll never be notified that this is even happening. So that's why it's important uh, for you guys that are probably not those of you that are here because you probably have hit the bell already. But those of you who are watching the video uh, after the fact, if you want to be notified that we're doing this, make sure that you hit that notification bell so that uh, you can be part of the Q&A and part of the show. Um a couple things here. Um, thank you for those of you who are here. If you want to support the channel, certainly super sticker, super chat. That's uh, always welcome. Uh, those of you who are also here, please hit that like button. Uh, it does help the, the, the channel, the algorithm of YouTube and all that. And those of you who are watching and after the fact, of course, uh, hit that like button. That always is just the, the price of admission that I ask you to pay is hit that like button. It certainly uh, does help. Um, so yeah, I think we'll get about 40 or 50 people that, that'll watch this uh, live. So that will help us get some good questions here. I want to go for about an hour. Um, do have some plans, uh, good friends of ours. Uh, we're going to dinner with them tonight. So uh, definitely have to wrap this up at four uh, or around four o'clock Pacific time. So uh, did some re I always do some reading online and checking out the seller forums and and uh, whether it's on you know Facebook I know a lot of you guys don't like doing that but for me um, I like checking out the forums to help other people for one if uh, maybe someone has a problem uh, I like to chime in and uh, give my take on it which may not always be a hundred percent correct but I do the best that I can to help people. And that's kind of part of it. And I come across a lot of posts where people, you know, they're like two weeks in, maybe even a weekend, and now they're trying to reach out for some help. And it's it usually has to do with um, scamming and feeling like they've been scammed, right? And so for those of you guys who've been selling for a while, um, by now you've you've encountered at least one scammer uh, in your your uh, eBay business career. And if you haven't, well, it's just a matter of time before you finally come across somebody who um, isn't, doesn't have your best interest in mind. They're trying to take advantage of you and your situation. Uh, real quick, <clears throat> thank you, Austin, for uh, the super chat. Um, I really appreciate everything that you do to, to support the channel. Um, and every, everyone else that, that asks uh, uh, great questions and participates. So thank you. Um, so as far as the scamming, I think a lot of it has to do from a lot of the posts that I've seen, it's a lot of, uh, the sellers just sort of freezing in the headlights, right? They're not, um, they're not being proactive to resolve the issue and whether it is, you know, someone that's saying item not as described and they open a return right and there, you, you may not accept returns, which if you've watched enough of my videos, you know, that's not a thing, right? You got to. You got to really be either uh, pays returns or buyer pays returns. One of the two free returns or buyer pays returns. No returns really is not a, a valid workable solution because most buyers know if they want to return an item bad enough, they, they will. But the issue that I've come across is it's 
sellers that do not react in time. So if you have a uh, return request, um, you, eBay only gives you a, you know, a few days to, to rectify that, to approve the return label. And if you don't do anything with that, that's going to time out. eBay is going to give a refund to your buyer and they're not going to ask that buyer to return it. They're just going to say, we're done with this. And of course, you now have to rely on eBay to sort of unravel the whole thing and uh, to rely on any rep uh, at eBay. You know, it's like um, getting lucky, you know, like winning a lottery, you know, going out and buying a lottery ticket and, and winning to get the, the right rep that might be able to help you. Um, but by then, it's just really a shot in the dark. So my main thing is as sellers, you need to effectively communicate with your buyer. So if that buyer opens up a return, go in and approve the return request. As painful as that may feel, uh, approve that request. And once you've done that, I this is what I do. I reach out and send a message to the buyer, letting them know I've, I've approved their return request, you know, um, Please send the item back. It's not a good time to argue about the condition of the item because they have the item in their possession, whether it's still perfect and they're just trying to get over on you. Maybe they're trying to get a partial refund resolution. Don't get into the actual condition of the item. Just let them know. Here is the return label. And what I like to do sometimes if I'm buying the return label separate, I'll attach it to that email or that message through eBay as well. And uh, please return it back in the same um, way that we send it to you, um, the same type of packaging, return all internal uh, packaging that came with the item, all accessories. And, um, you know, we will, uh, upon receipt, now this is what I do. Upon receipt, we, per eBay's policy, we inspect the item to make sure it is the same one that we sent you. And I do put a little thing in there that we do have a way of telling if it's the same item we shipped. And for those of you guys know, have heard some of my videos or watched some of my videos before, we use that marker where you can use the black light. We use a specific mark where you it's a, on a part of the item that no one's really going to look at anyway. And so when we get it back, we could check for it to see if it's the same item, right? So we have ways of doing that. So I let the buyer know. So we put all that out there, not, not in an accusatory way, in any way, shape or form, but you just want to let them know due to the nature of eBay and how eBay is currently, uh, we do check to make sure that the item is the same as the one we ship to you. Now, if everything checks out to what you're saying, that it is a, an issue with the item, uh, of course, we'll certainly give you a full refund and that includes the initial shipping. Now, a lot of times buyers will say INAD item not as described because they really have a remorse issue and they don't want to have to pay for that return label. And so you get it back, you plug it in, um, everything works fine. What they said didn't happen. And, you know, you could probably relist it, but you're on the hook for that return shipping label. Well, and I've even had reps at eBay tell me this, that go ahead and deduct that amount from the from their uh, refund with the refund tool. So that's something to consider. But really, I think 99% um, of the, the scams or the people we say are scamming us, we have a lot more control as sellers over than we think we do. And of course, the other small percentage is the chargeback issue. I've only had maybe two or three chargebacks. Now, knock on wood, now I'll probably get one this evening because I've said that. But two to three chargebacks in the last say three years of doing this full time. And uh, I've not lost one. And it's because uh, I have a, a way to do it. You guys can watch my videos. I have a, a chargeback video. And it's because a lot of sellers just don't know. They up, try to upload a picture. I don't know why eBay wants us to send a photo. But when we do, we lose the case because we don't give eBay enough information to pass on to the credit card companies. And they're, therefore, People know that they file false chargebacks in hopes that they're going to get a seller who doesn't know how to, to navigate through this wonky system that eBay gives us for chargebacks. And a lot of us just um, lose the case because of that. So um, I just wanted to, to kind of throw that out there as far as scams. You get a lot of these people that say, hey, I was scammed here, I was scammed there. But I think um, if we go back and look how we handled that or how some of these people say they were scammed 
initially handled that situation, there's usually two or three things that that seller could have done differently to avoid getting scammed. So that's my subject material for the day. I, I hope that helps somebody. Um, communication is key, guys. You know, um, reaching out to your, your buyer as quickly as you can after they open that return request, after they send you that initial uh, email and let them know that you do have a system in place and it's not a problem, send that return back and you handle it in a professional way, um, you're going to uh, be able to combat a lot of that nonsense. So I uh, want to say hello. We have, uh, of course, you met Austin, uh, set the super chat. Thank you for joining us today. We have Nancy Thomas. Hope everyone had a good day. Uh, we have Deborah JK. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have the disgruntled octopus. Morning, all. Uh, Elio Mora, these lives, uh, love these lives. And thank you. I, I appreciate, I like doing them. Uh, the, the fact that we right now only have 27, we'll probably get more as we go. But just being able to help you guys and, and answering your questions, um, it really fires me up to do more videos, to be honest with you. It's, you know, um, again, I kind of go back to how I felt a couple of years ago when I first started this channel. I didn't think uh, really anyone wanted to hear from, you know, a, a, a guy like me who just, He's just a basic guy, right? There's nothing special about me. Uh, yet there's a lot of people. We have over 10,000 going on 11,000 subscribers. And uh, I'm thankful for each and every one of you guys, really. Um, so um, thank you for, for being part of this uh, live stream. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, no one designs too. Hey, John, another day, another dollar. My awesome wife, Jenna's also with us. Um, uh, how you doing? I hope all are well and sales are plentiful. And uh, we have no one design. Hey, uh, Miss FAE, thanks again for the live stream. <laughs> um, we have Semper Fi. Uh, how you doing? You're not first this time. He's usually first in commenting on a lot of videos. Um, we have Aussie Tech Savvy, morning from Australia. How you doing, Aussie? Uh, let's see. Also, Gail Carlson's in the house. Uh, how you doing, Gail? Uh, we do have Deborah with a... Uh, question it looks like i had a chargeback recently and i sent a picture to the case but the picture consisted of a narrative of the whole situation so i'm hoping to get a positive outcome the spire was a scammer for sure well yes that's so those of you who have been watching my chargeback video um what has worked for me because ebay of course wants you to upload one photo which is ridiculous if you have a chargeback situation that the buyer is claiming you know item not as described or or whatever a photo, they say, is worth a thousand words, but when you're dealing with eBay, it doesn't mean anything. It's really useless. So the way you get around that is you utilize the Word document, like an MS Word document or something of that nature, limit it to one page, um, write up exactly your side of the story. And a lot of times these people who do a chargeback will not even have given you a chance to do a return, won't even communicate with you, right? And so they are violating their credit, their own credit card agreement, which requires the consumer to reach out to the merchant to, in good faith, to solve the problem. And they, the chargeback process is only in place to step in when there's a breakdown in that communication. And let's say the vendor, or in this case, you fail to follow through and take care of the situation. So it's not, um, a, it's not a process that's there for the buyer to just take advantage of. And so if you point that out in your one page Word document that the buyer did not act in good faith, they did not once reach out to me to resolve this problem, they did not open a return, um, they have not communicated with me, and the only level of communication that we've received is a chargeback request which is in violation of your own terms and conditions with that customer, um, you know, and then explain what other things that may have happened with this. Like, you know, it, you know, is it a brand new item? Um, you know, may, tell them to make reference to the actual listings to see further photos of the item, because of course, eBay only gives you that one photo. And when, you know, when you're done, um, make a screenshot of that word document and upload that as your photo for your chargeback. And that's how you do it. It's all about information. And unfortunately 
eBay's process limits the amount of information that uh, uh, you can send out. And my awesome wife, I think she's a little bit biased. You are special, John. Yes, I am special in very many ways. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm just a regular guy that's out here, you know, doing the same thing a lot of you guys are. Um, some of you are supplementing your current jobs, your current income. Uh, some of you do this full time. But the bottom line is we're out here doing this because not because we want to. I think some of us may have do it because we want to. Maybe it's a hobby you do on the side of your, your current job. But there's a lot of us that do this because um, this is this is the way we're going to make our living, right? Uh, we have the means of obtaining this product that we're, we're able to sell. And through experience, uh, we've made it work. And that's kind of what I've done here. And um, this channel is really to document my journey and to tell you, uh, yeah, I come across a lot of just garbage, but um, I, I want to document that and share it with you because somebody else, chances are they're going to come across that kind of situation, whatever that may be. And the whole goal of this channel is to, to help you guys navigate through it so you don't have to experience a lot of the heartache and the frustration that comes along with it like, you know, like I have. So um, hopefully, uh, and, and of course, your feedback that you share with others, uh, when you send me messages, right, to say, hey, here's what I'm going through, I also learn from that. So this channel is selfishly uh, a way for me to grow as well. Um, Semperfy, 1918, got a negative, no contact or anything said, box damage and item doesn't fit. So what you can do is, of course, reach out to your buyer and, you know, encourage them to return it. Now, I don't know the, the status of your account, but from my experience, um, if you put a feedback removal request through eBay after you've processed that return, um, you may get a, someone that'll say, no, we can't remove this negative feedback. But it's been my experience a few days after that, that feedback gets removed. So something to consider. But, um, you know, it just really depends on on the situation that you're dealing with, what, you know, what happened with the transaction and all that. But um, negative feedback, a lot of people blow it off. And I was thinking about this before the live stream. You no, know, negative feedback isn't as important as it used to be. Um, it used to be really bad. It really hurt you in search. It doesn't hurt you in search anymore like it used to. You can walk, look at a lot of sellers right now who have just feedback, negative feedback after negative feedback, and they have a ton of sales, right? But for me, if I have a buyer that's on the fence, maybe my item's intriguing to them. I know for me, myself, when I buy an item, I, I do look at that when I'm on the fence. If I have an item that I'm thinking about buying, um, about to pull the trigger, I'll look at reviews on the item if I can find it, like if I'm dealing with Amazon. And I'll also look at reviews for the seller. If that seller is full of just negative reviews, then uh, I may just go look somewhere else. And that's just kind of how I roll. So, um, so you know, maybe not, they'll tell you it's not as big of a deal, but that's on the technical side of things. Um, you still have human beings that are that are out there looking at your item, considering doing business with you. And if you don't have a relatively clean feedback history, it's gonna make things a little bit harder. We have Archie in the house, Biscuit Butt. What's going on? How you doing? Uh, hopefully you're working on some eBay stuff while you're watching this live stream. Um, we have uh, Victor Walorka, or Wawiorka. Sorry to butcher that name. I apologize. Uh, good afternoon. And so good afternoon to you. You must be on the West Coast. Uh, let's see. Je Deborah says, this buyer said I sent him sheets, not as described, almost immediately after they tried them. They ripped into an L-shaped almost immediately. So what type of sheets? I'm curious uh, as to what you're selling there. But, um, you know, it's funny. A buyer will buy your item. They'll even use the heck out of it, right? I had someone buy one of my, my coffee machines. And they said, yeah, we used it. We used it often. And uh, they opened a return request like on the 29th day because they uh, totally... Who knows? Maybe they misused it. They may have dropped it in water. Maybe they did something. They said that they woke up one morning and it stopped working. So um, what I started doing is whenever you're filling out your item specifics and it asks you to, to put a warranty in there, I'll usually put 30 days because let's be, let's be honest. Um, uh, 
our return policy is really a warranty policy. Um, you know, that buyer could have received it, left you positive feedback. It works great. I love it. And then 29 days in, here's a return request because it doesn't work anymore or something happened and it's not up to expectations. So um, Rich Colby, just found your channel. Love the name, dude. That's awesome. Listing right now. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those channels that uh, uh, I came up with the name about a year before I even started reselling full time. I was joking with a uh, colleague at my work saying, you know, if they close their office, I'm going to do the flipping ain't easy channel. See my dog, uh, Chewy, right there. <laughs> so we have two little dogs and uh, they are camera shy. So um and especially that one, Chewy will not let me hold him. So won't let anyone hold him. Um, so yeah, um, flipping ain't easy. It's definitely something that was a joke that we first started off with this title. And about a year into reselling full time, I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. I've been watching a lot of people on YouTube. And I think it was the time I became irritated. I think watching a certain channel, which I won't name, they were just giving out bad information. They were kind of winging it. And it's like, that's not true at all. And I'm like, I'm tired of this. So I decided, you know what, instead of complaining about this person um, to myself while I'm working, let me just go ahead and make this channel. It's probably not going to go anywhere. And it didn't for the first few months. And I got very discouraged. But, you know, it was the few people that were watching me that kept me going. And here we are today. So Maybe I feel the same way about 100,000 subscribers as I do as I did back then, about 10,000. I feel like it's so far out of reach, but uh, it's a goal, and we're going to try to keep cranking out content for you guys. And hopefully, Flipping Ain't Easy is, is uh, one of those channels you guys turn to. I really pride myself on trying to give you guys good information, and uh, hopefully, uh, I haven't steered too many people wrong. So, um, Probably bed sheets. So as far as Deborah, yeah, bed sheets, 350 under armor sheets. Wow. Must be some pretty nice sheets. So um, they opened a, um, and they ripped, huh? She said they ripped into an L-shaped almost immediately. That sounds like they were trying to make those sheets fit into something that wasn't meant. Maybe they, they had a king and they bought queen. So um, I think that's my mail carrier. And so Jenna's going to get that mail. So I, I uh, apologize for this. Usually my mail carrier will come here about 1130. And today we have a replacement. That's why. So uh, my apologies. And my dogs love the mailman because they like to bark at them. So sorry about the, uh, the interruption. Generally, we try to carve out a time where we're not interrupted like this. And I think we got a return too. So that's always fun. Um, so Rich Colby, uh, just, uh, okay. I just said hi to you. Uh, we have, it's got to get down here. Okay. Do you incorporate shipping costs into your selling price or do you cha charge shipping on everything? I charge shipping for about 90%, 95% of the items that I, I list. Um, and the reason for, for doing that is, if someone wants to return the item, you know, let's say they have a remorse return, uh, I'm not going to return the original shipping cost. So, you know, there's a few videos ago I came out saying I'm going to start moving a lot of my listings over to free returns. And the items that are two pounds or less, I generally uh, do have as free returns and I can absorb the cost because I'm getting that 10% top rated seller discount on my final value fees. Um, so generally what I'll do is if a cop shows someone sold an item for 30 bucks with free shipping, I will say, okay, if this is a two pound or less item, it's going to cost me up to $10 to ship this. So I'll back the price down by that amount and list it at that price and then add the uh, appropriate shipping cost. I have a $4.99 shipping for anything like that's under like eight ounces. Uh, I have a $6.99 shipping that's uh, for any other first class item up to a pound. And then uh, $9.99 for two pounds or less. Um, and then it, it goes to calculated immediately after that. Because I did come up with a video a while back doing that hybrid shipping policy. And that's something I guess you can consider. 
But what was happening is, as I look back on a hybrid shipping policy, which is like, it really costs you 60, but I'm going to charge the buyer 50 to ship it and eat the other 10. I was getting a lot more East Coast. I'm over here on the West Coast. I get a lot more East Coast customers. And I kept finding that uh, I was my item was really more attractive or just as attractive to them as it was a West Coast buyer. And um, I was eating a lot of extra money on the shipping. So now I just went in and set my shipping for uh, allowing the customer the same discounted labels that I get. And what I do is I will add a dollar handling when I'm setting up my shipping policy on the larger items because the bubble wrap ain't free. These boxes, I'm ordering boxes from Uline at, uh, in bulk for about two bucks a clip um, after shipping and everything. Um, my tape and everything else, it's not free. And it's all the cost of doing business. But, you know, you go out to the store and buy something, you notice that things have gone up, right? They're absorbing all these costs into the actual sell price of their item. And that's what you should should do uh, consider doing if you if you can, because uh, you know listing on eBay is not free. The cost of of all these supplies they they add up. And while you can write them off in your taxes, um, you're paying for them. And um, sometimes you have to pass the cost of that to your to your buyers. And that's why you know another topic that comes up you see a lot of people doing. Hey, I charge ten dollars shipping to this person, and it really only cost me seven. Um, so I'm giving back the three dollars. No, um, that's that's they signed up for it. They're fine with that ten dollars. They paid you that ten dollars. I know you're an honest person, but you honestly have to assess your costs as a seller. That money needs to go back into the supplies that you're buying uh, if you're really running a business. Um, and you know what? The honesty part is you advertise the actual shipping. You didn't say. I'm going to charge you the exact price of shipping. Now, if you did, then of course you'd have to return that. But generally when you put shipping on eBay, it's just one amount, you know, and of course, if you're going to do like multiples, if you're allowing them a discount for multiple items, still absorb some of that cost into that amount. Don't just give the exact cost of that label. Um, I mean, in the long run, you're going to lose money, I think. Uh, Rich also says it's amazing how people can even, uh, uh, those returns approved eBay needs to tighten that up. You know, it's been my contention that, uh, eBay needs to do like Mercari. You get three days, um, before, before that seller gets their money, you have three days as a, as a buyer to give them whatever stars and to approve that you've received the item. And once you've done that, then, Hey, it's on you. If the item breaks, then you know what? Just. You have to deal with the manufacturer or um, better luck next time. And, and it, it seems to work. I haven't seen a lot of people complain. I haven't seen many buyers complain about Mercari's return policy. And I haven't seen a lot of sellers complain. So um, I don't know. Maybe eBay really feels that they have to do a lot of these things to keep their buyer on the platform. And to me, that speaks volumes about the platform, right? If you had such a great product, if you had such a great platform, uh, a buying platform uh, in the first place, you wouldn't need to do these things to keep your buyers coming back. That's just my opinion. Okay, so back to the sheets. Deborah had, uh, they had them for two months, never contacted me, just open a chargeback. So for me, if you're still dealing with that chargeback situation, Go back in, write that Word document, let them know they never contacted you at all. You have a generous 30-day return policy. They never used it. And outside that 30-day return policy, we do not warranty our items. So unfortunately, this is not an item not as described situation. Uh, this is simply someone wanting to return the item outside the uh, outside of our terms and conditions. And uh, anything that they're doing at this point is in bad faith. That's kind of what I would say. And, uh, you know, I think the misconception with chargebacks is that, at least from a, a seller stand, standpoint, is that all the buyer has to do is open a chargeback and uh, the credit card company is just going to try to get that money back from them. And that's not true entirely. Um, the credit card company is going to ask you as a buyer to justify and give them some documentation. So when they go in and open the chargeback on your behalf 
to that company that they're dealing with, they have some information as to why this chargeback is being open. And the reason why I know that is, is I've actually had to open a couple chargebacks a couple years ago, um, quite large chargebacks. And I won both of those cases, but it wasn't fun at all. I had to go in, find invoices. I had to go in and find documentation, um, communication that was back and forth about promises that was made that were never kept. And I had to forward that on, must have been about 20, 20 uh, documents that I had to forward over. And um, it was because of that I won my case, I believe. But I can just imagine someone who's not prepared to provide that information. It's going to be harder for that credit card company to justify a chargeback if that buyer isn't willing to uh, provide anything. And I think that's where a lot of people think uh, incorrectly that the uh, the seller is just out of luck once a chargeback is, is uh, open. And that's just not true. Gail Carson, uh, my first return, they order a pinball manual from me. I sent it and they said, uh, sent the wrong one. The one they said I sent never had. So I'm waiting for them to send it back. That's interesting. So that sounds like a swap out. Maybe they had the wrong manual. You had the right one. And now they, they don't care about the one they have, but they're going to send yours back to get their money back. So that's easy. Um, communication before they send it back, communicate that, you know, Hey, no problem. Send it back. We have a way to know that this is, you know, our item. They don't know that. Um, hopefully you can get into kind of a habit of like marking, uh, your item in some way. So it's not noticeable to the, to the buyer. And that way, when you get it back, you can, you can describe exactly why, you know, this isn't yours. You have two options. Once you get it back, if you know, it's not your item, you can open an IC3.gov uh, fraud complaint, internet fraud complaint uh, under the penalty of perjury, and then contact eBay with that information. A lot of times they will go in and, and this is an unwritten thing. Uh, reps told me about six, seven months ago. Uh, this is sort of an unwritten thing that eBay does. Um, if you file that uh, IC3.gov complaint, they will usually, now I think a lot of it's depending on the, the amount of the item, they'll usually go in and just give the buyer a refund and release your funds um, or of course, or close the return case. Um, the other option is you can go in and deduct up to 50% uh, of that refund amount to the buyer. Of course, they're going to get half of it back and they're probably going to call eBay, complain. eBay is going to give them the other half that you kept, um, not from you, but from out of their pocket. But it's another way to resolve your situation provided now, if you're going to use that refund tool, you have to be a top rated seller offering 30 day returns or any other seller that offers free 30 day returns to be able to utilize that refund tool. Um, now, uh, Gail says, if I understand it, if the item is not returned by a certain date, eBay will close the return. And usually it's um, been it's like 30 days. Um, it's like 30 business days. Um and I think it also depends on the reason for the return that gives them that much time. So, of course, your buyer not wanting to pay for the return label um, will say item not as described. That will usually jack it up to like 30, 35 days. And now the thing is, let's say the 35th day is come and gone. Now eBay gives them an extra 10 business days after that date just to be sure that the item isn't crossed in the mail somewhere and they didn't send it at the last minute. That's kind of what they, they do. And then after that 10th business day, after the date it was supposed to be closed, then they close it automatically. The system will. I just had one where someone bought a glass carafe for a coffee maker, like a replacement one for their coffee maker. You know, a lot of people, they'll make coffee, get it all burn up because left it on the, on the, the hot plate there. And they'll order another one as a replacement. Well, they got it back. And I guess somewhere in the item specifics, it was, it was actually describing the coffee maker as a programmable coffee maker. And so they wanted to return the item under the guise of buyer said or seller said that this uh, carafe is programmable. Now, there's not one programmable carafe in existence that I know. It doesn't even make sense, right? But they got the, they got the, uh, item not as described, um, a return label. And of course I let them know, you know, Hey, um, 
we will accept the return and again the whole spiel they just kept it right and that finally dropped off automatically so uh yeah they will eventually close the return it's just uh just a pain if you call them you know they'll tell you you know you need to wait past this date and then it'll automatically drop off um <laughs> no chewy no mailman good milkman bad <laughs> I swear, you know, it's, uh, I even asked my carrier yesterday. I said, you're going to be here tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So good. I know she's going to be here at 1130. Nope. And my fear was that I was going to have to get to the post office before five to, to drop these items off and get them scanned. But thankfully, even though they came during the live stream, uh, thankfully they showed up and I have not one, but two boxes. So I can just imagine what that's going to be when I mess with it. Uh, we have eBay addicts in the house. For those of you guys who are watching, we have 40 right now watching. Uh, be sure to uh, check out his channel on Friday about 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern. Uh, I will be a guest on his channel and, uh, you know, we'll take your questions and uh, like we're doing right now. So certainly that would be a fun one. And I got a sale. So we have a, I sold a juicer for $50 plus the cost of shipping. So that's, that's awesome. You know, the last couple of days have been sort of slow for me with sales. I had a, a pretty good run for about three or four days and uh, just sort of died out. And, uh, you know, if you've been watching my eBay account, anybody has been looking at it. Uh, I've increased the size of my store by about a hundred some odd listings. Um, what we're doing is Jenna's account is sort of and it's not anything that jenna was doing wrong i just really think that the size of the account there's a lot of different factors i really think my account has some good things going for it that uh um, maybe there's a problem with the account like i told you guys ebay doesn't even know if it's a business or personal account when you ask them so i think there's a glitch going on with my account but i also think it helps my account so we're migrating a lot of those listings from her store over to mine and then what she's going to do is she's going to, and this is kind of something we talked about today, uh, she's going to go in and start handling cross listings on Amazon, uh, Mercari. And as someone mentioned in uh, the live stream before, Etsy does do a lot more things now. So uh, like electronics, uh, health and beauty and that kind of thing. We're going to start migrating a lot of our existing stuff. It's been my contention that a lot of the five, 10, 15, $20 items that I don't like to mess with that still linger in my store uh, do fairly well on Mercari. So it's something that I plan on messing with here. Uh, we're going to be trying that route and see if we can get more eyes on our items. That's, that's certain, uh, certainly a good thing. Um, and if you know people ask me about cross posting, I, I agree with a lot of some of these YouTubers that say, don't bother cross posting until you really have a grasp of eBay uh, because it's really going to, to open up some potential problems like running out of stock. If you don't have a, a process in place, you sell something on Mercari and 20 minutes later it sells on eBay, you're going to run into a problem where you're someone's going to be disappointed. So you have to have a process in place so that you don't have that situation. Um, Helen, Helena E says, I sold an authentic unused coach wallet recently and the buyer opened a return request stating it was fake. I ended, ended up refunding because working with eBay is non-existent. Um, and so this is, this is another thing I, I see a lot of people do. It's that, you know, it's that idea of they just don't want to deal with it. Sometimes I would almost always, unless they can prove to you that that was a fake wallet, um, open a return, send it back. We'll be glad to give you a refund. Yes, paying that 10 bucks for that refund label, return label, uh, isn't fun. You know, it's 10 bucks that you had in your pocket that you're not going to have anymore, provided they return it back to you. But um, it puts the onus back on the, the buyer. Now they have to follow through, send it back, and it takes away the whole fishing for a partial refund at, uh, avenue, or in this case, uh, a full refund. And it almost tells me that if you know you send a, a, an authentic coach wallet out to them, if you know the stuff you're selling is authentic, it almost tells me that this buyer has done it before and they've got away with it before. They were able, able to get a full refund or a partial resolution. 
And, um, you know, we have to train our, our buyers to follow eBay policy. And I think unless it's your fault as a seller, uh, it's probably bad practice to give them partial or full refunds without them sending back the item. We're just, we're training these buyers to uh, circumvent eBay policy. And then when they get to that seller who follows eBay policy, they're trying to hold it over their head. And uh, I just really think that um, collectively, I mean, I can't do it alone. Collectively, if we follow that process, I think it's going to be uh, better for everyone. Now, I've done partial refunds. I've even done full refunds without them sending it back. But that buyer has had to prove to me that I screwed up bad before that happens. Austin says, I'll probably get a return this week for something the buyer didn't notice in the photos. When I get to the point of this, when eBay won't hold all my funds with basic store and 205 solds. So when will I get to that point? Well, usually it's like 60 to 90 days. And uh, you'll also notice that when you sell an item, you won't usually get the funds released to your account until the item's been delivered. Um, so th they're just trying to protect themselves. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but eBay is trying to protect themselves from the bad sellers, the, the fly by night sellers who are out to scam buyers. And eBay doesn't want the reputation that, you know, I bought this item and I never got anything and, and they kept my money. So they're going to treat you like a criminal. Um, and unfortunately, you have to be in the eBay jail because of bad people that uh, want to scam people. And it's unfortunate, but it's something you have to do. Be a good seller. Do everything you're supposed to do. And uh, this return shouldn't hurt you at all if you handle it properly. So that's kind of what eBay is looking for. They just want to make sure that you're going to be a good seller and follow their processes. And eventually, usually 60 to 90 days, they'll uh, release you from that jail, start giving you quicker payouts, and um, won't hold your money when a return is open. Uh, Rich says, bubble wrap, tape, padded envelopes, time to package and take the post office. All is not free. Uh, right. I, I mean, uh, just drive into the post office. Thankfully, my carrier came during the live stream because we we're going to have to go five miles each way. My post office isn't close. My UPS store is like across the street. But, uh, you know, drive into the post office. And then if you want it scanned, you have to scan and stand in line. Of course, you can use the machine, but they tell you that it's not an official scan. So um, what are you going to do? So don't feel guilty about taking money. Well, not taking money, but, you know, spending $7 on a label and you've collected $10 for shipping. It's don't feel bad about that at all. Um, LSGS Rob says, you're nice. I was did calculated and charged a $4 handling when I did electronic shipping isn't free and whatever that amount is. I mean, usually it's a dollar for me because sometimes I will take, let's say the, I have a, a 19 by 17 by 10 box and I will weigh it when I'm doing my listing to be, let's say 20 pounds, um, you know, figuring in the weight of my packing material. Then I finally pack it, right? And it's 18, 19 pounds. And it drops the shipping by a dollar or two less than what the, the buyer paid. Um, I'm okay with that. And I've never had one complaint uh, with that. I will always try to overestimate um, the size and weight of my package so that uh, uh, we don't have to deal with anything out of my pocket, that kind of thing. What did you miss? Well, um, you missed a whole lot of me rambling about scams and answering questions. Not a lot. I've got about another 20 minutes. So hopefully if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat here. Um, LSGS Rob, in my opinion, you should be making money on shipping if you're selling online. I mean, it's it's part of the job. Your, your, your time, your materials are worth something. Now, no one's saying that you should be gouging the buyer. Not at all. And I just think there's a lot of people out there from the posts that I've read that feel really guilty for some reason because they've collected too much money for shipping. There's a lot of sellers out there right now who will just automatically give a full refund of the difference and that's their business model. And you know what? More power to you. If you're making enough money on the item, I suppose that's a way to do it. But honestly... Um, if you go back and calculate how much you've spent over the year in supplies, you really should rethink that practice. 
Um, Kent, uh, Douglas Kent says eBay will never move the pendulum back towards the seller. You're probably right. And uh, you hear me complain about it over and over. And I complain about different things that eBay does the sellers because it's my hope that eBay will genuinely try to fix some of these problems that uh, uh, maybe they, you know, a lot of these executives, they've never sold an item in their life. Okay. They don't know the problems that we experience when we use their, their software, when we're dealing with customers. Um, they just look at their SOPs uh, uh, and try to tell us what we should be doing to adhere to their policies. And uh, honestly, that's out of touch as far as I'm concerned. You go to these seller check-ins and I'm reminded so often by just how they handle us when we're asking questions. Uh, you watched uh, the Crazy New York Driver show. He mentioned on his program last week that uh, uh, the way they answered my question, uh, taking on a, a question, I uh, forgot even what it was, but uh, it was about oh, the, the impact on negative feedback on the, the real feedback impact on a seller within 24 to 48 hours of the feedback being left as far as it pertains to search. And, oh yeah, that's a good question. And she starts reading the question and she gets a, like a text or something and she like looks over and looks down and she's like, oh, well, we'll have to give that to uh, one of our teams. We'll circle back. Well, no one circled back to me. So, you know, it's one of those things where they're out of touch. And a lot of these events we go to just confirms that for me. Tommy Bernard podcast don't matter. They can do a chargeback for six months on credit card, regardless of platform, right? Um, Credit card company takes the decision. eBay can't do anything about it for chargebacks. We have all of our ducks in a row. Have to have all your ducks in a row. But you can do everything you can to assist eBay by giving them as much information. And shame on eBay for not providing us a way to give more than a photo. I mean, it's just it's just horrible. And if you don't know any better, you're going to try to give them a photo. And uh, that's about it. Uh, yep. Tell them you have surveillance and film everything in coming out, outgoing. I mean, the buyer doesn't know. And if they're trying to pull one over on someone, they're going to like, well, wait, um, this may not work. Um, of course, that only works for some buyers. Uh, some buyers just will still try to follow through with that scam or, you know, try to get, get over on you. And you know what? More power to them. And then you could finally say, once you get burned, it's the cost of doing business, I guess. Um, no one designed two uh, chargebacks are easy to dispute and when if the chargeback was outside the allotted return policy time, few of them after 60 days and I won them all. Well, you can go up to six months, right? And what happens is, and excuse me, my nose is itchy today. What happens is um, they have a, and, and I had this happen, as a buyer, I charged back a pallet. It was just nothing close to what was what was mentioned in the manifest right and um of course it was over 90 days had passed and i contacted the credit card company a large credit card company capital one in this case and i said what's going on with this and initially they said we're saying well we're not going to be able to do anything for you here and um you know they transferred me to somebody and that supervisor said well let me put you on hold for a minute because I see something's wrong with this. And they came back and said, um, we've timed out. We were supposed to handle this within a 90-day period, and we're going to eat this. And it was quite a bit of money. And um, thankfully, of course, I called back and you know they, had, they still didn't remove it from my account. And I said, listen to your recorded conversation. And of course, they went back, listened to the recorded conversation, and they lived up to what they told me and they um, deducted that from my account. So just, uh, and it turned out to be a credit. I had the zero balance on that, on that card. So uh, it was kind of cool. They didn't give, they said, we, we could send you a check or we can give you a credit. I said, just let it be a credit because I'm going to be buying more stuff with it. So um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of uh, details that a lot of newer sellers just don't know. And uh, just know this, that there, it is very difficult on both sides to either win and or uh, win a chargeback, whether you're the, the, the person that's buying the item or the seller. As long as you're doing everything you can to fight that chargeback, then that's all you can control. 
And Hel Helena E says, I always photograph the item with the packing slip showing the sealed edges to avoid swap outs. And, uh, you know, I tend to trust the, the buyers who provide me photos with the returns versus the ones that just try to claim something's wrong. And those photos will help you determine. Now, that's not my item. Uh, let's see. And Gail says, I've tried to contact them, but they do not I want to commu communicate. And you know what? You need to put in there that the, the buyer did not act in good faith when they opened their charge back per the terms of their own credit card, your own credit card agreement. This buyer is required to reach out and deal with the merchant. And they did not do that here. And I can tell you um, that is going to be something that eBay can, can back up. They, they have the records if the, the buyer reached out to you or not. So it's definitely helping eBay fight on your behalf. And, you know, we, we have this $20 charge. So if you lose the charge back, eBay charges your account 20 bucks. And it, it feels like a money grab. And, and let's, let's face it, it is a small money grab. But to be honest with you, um, if you have a legitimate, um, if you have a legitimate argument against that chargeback, you should be able to win that chargeback by providing that information. And I think most people who get hit with that $20 fee for losing the chargeback probably did not have much of a case or did not provide information to eBay or didn't know how. And that's shame on eBay for not giving us the ability to do that. 35 days on a return. Uh, I've never had it that long. At most, it's 15 business days or three weeks. Never been longer than that for me, regardless of what I sold. Check the reason. So if it's not as described, they give the buyer more time. And I can tell you this because the other day I was looking at it and it's like, wow, you know, uh, I haven't heard from this person in a week. They, you know, shows that they haven't sent it back and it's going to give them another two to three weeks. Uh, at least for the date they have to return it by. And it, it's excessive. But a, I've been told by eBay representatives when I called about the, their policy, it's based on the reason why the return was open. So an item not described is going to give the buyer more time than changed mind. Um, no one designed two item specifics. It's a tricky one and customer will use it as a tool to do bad returns. So uh, usually put NA in all my item specifics that I deem irrelevant. Um, yeah, it is. It is kind of tricky, but you know what, to be honest with you, you could put everything correctly in the item specifics and they can just say whatever they want. And eBay doesn't care why they open an item not as described. They're just going to allow them to return it. Um, I only list cross, cross list that I have multiples. It cuts the confusion, but then again, that's just me. Uh, I deal with multiple replenishable business model and, I'm yet to find a inexpensive uh, tool that would allow me to cross post and keep track of inventory in real time. Um, until that happens, we're just gonna, you know, we're just gonna wing it. And unfortunately, if it comes down to Mercari and eBay selling the item at the same time, um, the, the, the platform that penalizes me the least is going to be the one that gets the cancellation because I have to protect my account. And um, you know, someone is going to be disappointed and I'm not gonna do it to where it hurts my account. Just not going to. Um, and there, you know what, that may seem, that might seem on the face, on the surface as being dishonest, but you have to protect your account. And you know what, if you did something shady, then you should eat it, right? But who's to know that two people are gonna buy the same item within five, 10 minutes of each other. So that's kind of how I roll with that. Uh, Rich says, always a good practice to look at the situation with yourself as the buyer. If you're willing to pay your own shipping and handling and it seems reasonable, then proceed. If not, uh, pivot and change is necessary. Okay. Um, Helena says, Coach Wallet, eBay said there's nothing they could do and suggested a full refund so the buyer couldn't leave negative feedback. I did ask for the wallet back in the same condition I sent it. And the buyer did seem surprised that I wouldn't issue a refund until the wallet was returned to me. So yeah, he or she, in this case, was a scammer. I am, you know, here's the thing. eBay is good about reach out to your buyer, communicate with your buyer. Shame on them for offering or telling you to give them a full refund without demanding the item back because um, that's not how it works. Um, the idea that the buyer cannot leave a negative feedback if you give a refund, 
That's not how it works either. The buyer can still leave you a negative feedback. And of course, you can call up and uh, or use their tool online and request for it to be removed. And chances are they uh, will consider it, but that doesn't mean that they will. Um, in fact, their policy speaks to if the buyer returns the item then uh, and you refund them as a result of the return, then uh, the feedback removal is considered. So uh, certainly uh, they were scamming you. Make it a practice. Um, unless it's egregiously your fault and they point it out to you, do not offer partials or full refunds. You know, let them know. Per eBay's own guidelines, um, here's the process we need to follow. Send it back. I'll be happy to pay for the return label if you think that there's a problem with this. And I'll give you a refund as, as, you know, as long as everything checks out when I get it back. Um, Helena says, I thought it was against the law to profit on shipping costs. No, no, no it's not. I mean, if, if, you know, you as a seller have costs involved and that's part of the shipping and handling, um, process. Um, there's no difference in an item that sold for 30 bucks with free shipping versus an item that sold for 20 bucks with the $10 uh, shipping and the label only costs you $7 to ship it. Um, in both cases, you're making an ad additional $3 over the cost of the label. And um, if someone can point to a law, I'll be glad to look at it. But uh, to me, um, there's in no way, shape or form, you're, you're being upfront with your shipping, right? If you have a $20 item and you put $10 shipping, you're informing that buyer of here's what it will cost you if you want to buy this item. Now, if somehow you said it was $20 plus 10 and then you snuck in a hidden fee and it's even more expensive, uh, here's the handling part of it, and you didn't mention that in your listing, then yes, I could see that as being unlawful. But, uh, you know, I've done this, you know, 2,000, 3,000 items a year, and uh, most of my items do uh, have additional shipping, and it's never been an issue. Uh, let's see. Rich says, just like the shady uh, practice eBay is doing when we sell an item and they send offers to our buyer with lower offers, unethical and shows that they're getting further out of touch with the sellers. Yeah, it's this thing where you sell an item, they check out, they go to pay for it, they pay for it. And on the bottom of the screen, it shows that same item being sold cheaper. And they're like, oh, wait, 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 why did I spend 20 for this? I could have spent 15. Um, I need to cancel. And so they they go and buy that item for 15. Now they go to cancel your item and you're left holding the bag. It's just bad business. You know, anytime you set up your, your site to confuse the buyer and you can't tell me that offering an item for cheaper than what they just paid is not causing buyer confusion. When you confuse your buyer, it causes um, a high level of um, customer effort. And, you know, that's, that's bad. You're, you're not creating an easy uh, shopping environment when you have to go and ask the seller to cancel your, uh, your item because you found it cheaper. It's just ridiculous. Uh, Ricardo says, greetings, John from Orange County. Did you just mention that the USPS machine scans aren't considered an official first scan? It's not. And they'll tell you that when you, uh, I believe they'll tell you that in the machine, but I'll do it anyway when, when I'm in a pinch, uh, rather than just dropping it in the bin and hoping for the best. Um, at least I have something to, to show, even though it's not an official scan. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple sellers that pointed out to me that, uh, it's not an official scan, but, uh, you know, at least you get some kind of a paper trail rather than just dropping it off in the bin. Um, Cumberland Carpets, Carpet Care. I figured out the shipping plus 10%, then add it to the price. Either way, the buyer pays shipping. There's a, a psychological effect to the word free. There is. Um, and if your item, after you've done that, it falls within the, the actual... Uh, market value of that item. So uh, I may think that this item is a $30 item. Uh, it may cost me $10. So you're going to charge $11 for that label. So you're going to price it as 41, but the market is really 35 or 32. Uh, you're going to have a harder time selling that item uh, to absorb that. So as long as you're pricing your item 
uh, to where it's within the actual market price uh, of the item or the solds um, of that item, you're going to have a better uh, chance to sell that item. Uh, my sales have picked up since the last few lives. Um, and that's because uh, I've done a lot of sourcing through uh, the electronics of the Goodwill here to, to supplement. Uh, I just paid for three pallets of merchandise that I will be picking up next week. And that'll give me uh, a boost to my store as well. But uh, I got to tell you, um, without the Goodwill sourcing, it would have been really sad. I've, I've made some pretty good sales with some of the stuff that I'm picking up. So uh, not to, you know, a lot of you guys already know. Uh, so nothing I'm sharing with you is, is new news to you, but it was new news for me. And this is one benefit that I get from having this channel is your awesome feedback and direction. Um, finally, when I had a lull in sourcing, I was able to, to listen to what you guys were offering me and it's definitely uh, was uh, good advice. So thank you for all of you who were telling me, uh, check out thrift and I haven't done the yard sale thing. We don't get a whole lot of yard sales out here in Vegas, not a lot of yards in Vegas, to be honest with you. It's a lot of the communities are just kind of mashed together. And, uh, any of you live in Vegas area, no, you can just go out in your backyard. You probably have rocks out there and generally you won't have much of a yard for a yard sale. And so it's a little bit less, uh, they have them, but as compared to California, it's not the same. Um, let's see. Rich says, I agree. Never give a refund back for extra they paid in shipping handling. Uh, they entered into a legal agreement and knew exactly what they're committing to 100%. And if you notice, when you do a refund with eBay, right, the refund tool will come up and what's grayed out? The out the original shipping that you charge that buyer is grayed out by default. eBay is not expecting you to give that original shipping back. Now I will unclick it, uh, click on it, and uh, offer that refund of the original shipping that they paid that I paid for that outbound label. If they're returning it because I screwed up, but if it's one of those things, even if it's an I ad, they're saying that hey you screwed up, but I can confirm that no, they're just trying to get around paying for the return shipping. They're not getting that outbound shipping back. And that's another reason why I don't build my shipping into the price of the item because, um, you know, returns happen. If you have a three to 4% return, that means out of every hundred items, you're going to get three to four of those items back. And that's 30, 40, 50, $60 a month or whatever the, the period is that I'm not paying out in original shipping fees um, that money's gone, right? In addition to the label that you're paying for, you're giving them all that money back, even the money that was hidden in your price that was allocated towards that shipping label, that buyer is getting a hundred percent of it back. Um, and to me, I'm willing to do that, um, only on very, very light items. It's not going to be a big deal when, um, you know, I get the item back eating three, four, five bucks for a, a first class label is not the same as 20, 30, or 40 bucks on a larger item. Um, and Kent says, reselling is hard and not for everyone. Well, I don't necessarily think it's hard. Um, I think it, there's so many intangibles that's required um, that it's not something that you can just say is easy. I've had people say, look, flipping is easy. And to me, if you could say flipping is easy, then you're not doing something right or you're not selling many items. You might have a few items listed but it's, it's not easy. So if you expect just to get up and just breeze through the day without having any upset customers, without having any chargebacks at any time during your career, without having any, um, you know, di diff difficult situations, you know, the other day I had, um, I took a hit on my account. I sold this stereo system and I was wrapping everything. I was getting the speakers wrapped up real nice. And the, the main unit was in the box. I don't know how it happened. The box slid off of my uh, shipping station and it made a loud thud. And I'm like, oh no. So of course, what do I do? I grab the unit, plug it in. Dead. Wasn't working. So of course, had to uh, tell the buyer and disappoint them. And they were cool with it, right? But you know, that's you can't have too many of those. You only have two before it hurts your account eBay gives you the first one. And after a certain amount of time that falls off, 
Uh, I think it's like a year. Um, but you know, it's just one of those things that I didn't account for mistakes happen, accidents happen. And that wasn't, certainly wasn't easy. It upset me. It was disappointing. It was an $80 sale gone. And, um, you know, tell me how easy that is. So, um, flipping ain't easy. That's just a hundred percent. Um, uh, it's work. Uh, Rich has been doing it since 98 and it's never been easy. A lot of folks don't realize that. And, um, you know, it seems like that on the surface. So that's why a lot of people will start this business and they will quit because they don't want to deal with returns. My friend thought it was easy. Um, I don't want to, after about two weeks, I don't want to deal with returns. Um, I don't want to deal with testing these items. I don't want to deal with inspecting these items. I don't want to deal with shipping these items. To me, that's the biggest pain in, in flipping is, you know what? You love the items that are sold, right? But what happens once you sell an item? You have to ship it. And that takes a lot of time. The more items you sell, the more time you have to devote to shipping. And it's it's not easy. Um, Chris says, not sure if you ever do clothes, but if you come across the big buy or warehouse clean out and it isn't your thing, I'll mess with it. I'll pay a finder's fee. Chris, you missed me out by about, I'd say, eight months. I had literally... 14 boxes of clothing and most of them were new and ta with tags. I had some Macy's uh, returns, uh, not returns, Macy's uh, shelf pulls that had new with tags, uh, had bought a lot of shelf pulls off of Amazon um, a couple years ago thinking, oh yeah, I knew clothes, you know, and stuff wasn't selling for me. And so uh, sold it locally to a lady for, I think she paid $1.50 a piece and I had Wow, I don't remember how many, over 500 pieces, around 500 pieces, she came and picked it up. So you missed me on that one. Rich says, reselling is not hard, but getting your processes in place and everything set up to make money while you're sleeping is work. It takes work to get there. It takes work to um, figure out what works for you. Some YouTuber might say, hey, this is what I do. You try to emulate that. Well, maybe that doesn't work for you. And maybe you sell something different Maybe that's just too involved or not involved enough for what you need. So you have to figure out and sit down and think about, okay, why is this process a problem? What can I do to improve this process for myself? Now, if you do that at a nine to five and take that to your boss, they're probably going to laugh at you, right? You don't have to worry about that as a reseller. You can implement these changes right away and make it work for whatever you're doing. But sometimes you have to sit down and figure that out. Uh, many watch YouTubers and get the wrong impression, right? Look at this nice car. Look at this nice house. Look at this nice resort. Look at this and look at that. I can I can tell you. I mean, there's nothing special about what I have going on. Uh, I'm just an everyday guy and um, just trying to share my experience with you guys. Um, and mis YouTube can be misleading because you a lot of times you only see the good. You only see the good. Um, let's see. At what point do you remove steel listings from your store or do you source them cheap enough that you can just let the, the non-sellers ride or the non? Yeah. So in this case, if I have a dead item, I'll keep lowering the price and, uh, eventually it'll sell. Now, what I, one thing I've noticed, and I, I noticed this last year and I haven't circled back until just recently telling you about cross listing on the Mercari, a lot of these items, I don't know what it is. But a lot of these smaller ticket items, your under $20 items, tend to sell better on Mercari. That may be because Mercari is more of a small item, maybe uh, online yard sale mentality. I don't know what it is, but a lot of the stuff that wasn't getting any traction on eBay was getting traction on Mercari for me. And so I, will, I would say to start cross-posting the smaller items over to Mercari. Uh, the smaller items, meaning anything, let's say under 20 bucks and give that a shot. And uh, of course, I wouldn't do that until you had some experience. And by the time you get to that point where you're, you're dealing with stale listings, you probably have enough experience to maybe venture out to another uh, uh, marketplace like Mercari. So that's something that uh, you can try. But you know what? Sometimes you just have to, to realize maybe I just got to take it down um, because eBay does penalize you for your, um, your sell through rate. And the higher the sell through rate you have, um, the more traction, uh, that eBay is going to give you. And someone made this 
because we're all trying to figure out the the algorithm. Someone made this point a while back ago that um, eBay will not give you more than you can handle. You can, you can prove to them that you can handle more business than, you know, through your actions and your listing habits and your um, keeping up with everything you need to keep up with, then they'll feed you more, right? And I think that um, your sell-through rate has a, a lot to do with that. I got to do better with my sell-through rate. Sometimes it's easy to want to hang on, hang on, hang on to that item and keep trying to lower it and do it. But if you have bad photos, if you have a bad description, if you have a bad title, if you have a bad product, it's going to hurt you in the long run. So um, do everything you can with what you could control. Try to blow it out, uh, clearance it out the best you can, even if it's maybe at your cost plus the cost of shipping. Um, but eventually you're going to have to just cut your, your losses at that. And let's see, at what point will you give yourself, I made it moment in reselling. Um, I don't think reselling is something that you can, unless you're really, um, finding a great source that can bring you six figures in every year. That's after your fees. And, you know, a lot of people will say like, I made a hundred between two accounts, made $130 in eBay last year. That's just eBay, not counting the other marketplaces, but I didn't make that. Um, I still have my, my shipping, my eBay fees, uh, I have my cost of goods. Um, you know, I made maybe half of that. Right. But I don't feel like I made anything. Um, I think for me, that's why you see like a lot of these, uh, big YouTubers, you know, like, uh, Harry tornado, he came out last year and said, Hey, I'm a, I used to be a full-time eBay, uh, eBayer that did YouTube. Now I'm a full-time YouTuber that does eBay. Right. Um, I think because of that, he can say he made it, but it wasn't because of eBay specifically. It was because of YouTube. Uh, it's really tough. I mean, someone like maybe Daily Refinement, I don't think even he, Chris, is even um, in a spot where you can say, hey, I've made it. Because otherwise, why would he be trying to refine his processes all the time? Uh, he would say, hey, I found it. I'm going to stick with it. But that's not what he's doing. So I, I really think um, from a reseller standpoint, um, this is just a means to an end and there's really no, I made it, um, side to it. Um, some of you out there can probably prove me wrong. You're making six figures after everything's said and done. And Hey, if that's working for you, then, um, you know, you're, you're the exception than the rule because more, most sellers on eBay, um, don't make more than 30, like 30,000 a year doing this. And that's full time. Uh, it's because, uh, many, many different things. I mean, it could be their sourcing, could be how their pictures look, could be how their titles are, could be how they handle the customer. So many variables in that equation. Um, and it's the, the ones that really have it knocked out. Their sourcing, everything is perfect. They have maybe have, they've expanded to a warehouse, they have employees and they're able to do those things to be a success. Whereas the normal folks like you and I will probably never be able to say they've made it. So guys, um, it's a little over an hour, actually a lot longer than I wanted to uh, be on this live stream. And I want to thank you. We have 50 people watching. I think this is a pretty good live stream uh, for not having a whole lot of subject material to share with you. But, you know, this ever ending journey that we're on to try to say that we made it. I mean, maybe hopefully some of you guys and hopefully maybe me can get to a point where we've said that, but I don't see that. I mean, from my current business model, I don't necessarily see that as happening. Maybe that'll change in a few years and maybe your situation will change in a few years. But um, all said and done, it's all another example of how flipping ain't easy. And I want to thank each and every one of you guys. Thanks for the super chat, Austin. And uh, comment down below, hit that like button on the way out. And of course, subscribe to the channel. And we will see you guys very soon.